Hey boys and girls, uh, welcome back to Monroe, uh, Monroe Live. Hey, um, we're underneath the, um, we're underneath the uh, Mach-E and uh, this big hole that you can see here now, that's where the battery used to be. So uh, Ben and I are gonna talk a little bit about what we found um, as we tore this thing to pieces and uh, some things that are obvious, some things that are good, some things that are a mystery. <laughs> so, uh, so let's start off maybe with uh, the back. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the guide that you got here? All right, there is a large stamp steel guide, as Sandy said, that this is slotted. The battery tray will come up into this. We'll show you on the battery tray the way it's removed, and it gets bolted in place. Uh, there is no real vertical structure to that because these are slotted. The only thing that's holding it up would be the compression force that the nut is putting um, onto the onto the fastener. So to me, I look at this and uh, maybe this is some kind of a, uh, like a manufacturing aid or something. Uh, they shove it up, make those bolts, make a couple of bolts in the front and that'll hold the battery and then they can get the rest of them around the structure. You should show them a little bit about what's going on with that, uh, the rockers where the uh, battery is bolted in maybe. All right, these rockers are really small for a body of weight. They have incorporated a lot of structure into the body, but there are, um, nuts that have been welded to the inside of the rocker going around. So the only fasteners that were holding this to the body in white ran down the, the exterior, down the rockers on both sides. So there were no front or rear fasteners directly to the body in white. We had the guide that was back here that Sandy mentioned. Um, and they did do a good job of mounting this to the vehicle. They're using the same fastener on the bottom side that they're using to hold their cradle to the body in white. So they're just kind of jumping into that, not making an additional uh, attachment point. It's a good locator as well mm -hmm. that uh, puts it in place before the back is in, so it will be a good guide. Mm -hmm. And then on the front, uh, the battery is attached uh, to this uh, extruded piece here. And what that's doing, if we will walk up to the front of the vehicle and kind of walk our way back again. Uh, in a, well, before we oh. go, uh, go up there, maybe, maybe what we can do is say that this battery is structural. Mm -hmm. this, is, this rocker is kind of like really um, shallow or weak. Um, uh, if, if you're looking at a standard, um, a standard unibody, but because the battery is structural, and wait till you see that, this, uh, this can be afford, uh, afford to be a little weaker because the battery now is like what Tesla's doing um, in, their, in, their, in their vehicles. They're turning the battery box into a structural member. So when we're talking here about guiding it and running it to bolts, we're talking about this is not just a battery box anymore. This is a structural case that is basically uh, holding the whole car together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now if now it make more sense about what's going on with this. All right. So if again if we walk towards the front of the vehicle to start with, um, we had these the cradle that had the tusks coming forward that we talked about in an earlier video. Um, a tusk is when it comes out to the side uh, to help with the small overlap rigid barrier test. But this part of the cradle when you have a frontal impact, will transfer forces back and uh, into the, the hollow cast aluminum portion of the cradle. And then these keep transferring the forces back and they're gonna go back to the outside to the rails of the battery tray. So what they're doing in a frontal impact is trying to get as much of the force into the structural members of the battery tray and not hit anything in the middle so that this casting won't come back in and hit the, um, hit the battery tray. Well, actually, I think this casting is also made to crush. So if we look at the, uh, these um, uh, ribs and whatnot, this has all been calculated to see what we can do is the car is crushing uh, up here. It's gonna fold into a certain degree, but if we look, the difference between where the absorbed tusks are and, uh, and this massive uh, uh, extrusion here is, what I think is a crush zone, and that protects the rest of the battery box. So this is kind of like a, a well-designed um, uh, crash worthiness kind of application. So this coupled with 
you know, two major rigid barriers, something's going to happen and that's going to come uh, basically uh, crushing in. So another, another good, uh, good opportunity. Let's talk about the connections. Uh, this is all also uh, kind of um, nice. They, they put everything pretty close together. Right, they do have uh, three high voltage connectors in the front. You have a power in, this is coming from the charge port. So when you charge your uh, vehicle, this is where the, the power will come in. You have a connector that is running to the front inverter and front motor. And then there is another connector here. This one runs up to the onboard charger and the DC to DC converter. Uh, and then there's a low voltage connector. Not a whole lot going on on this connection, just a little bit of battery management uh, that's, that's happening. So when we open it up, I'm not expecting a lot of low voltage going on. Um, then there is also four cooling lines that you can see here. Two of them connect to lines that run on top of the battery tray for the rear, um, the rear motor. And then two of them go into the battery tray itself for cooling the batteries. So one of the things that we noticed that were kind of yeah, man, good from a, an assembly standpoint is uh, these are your brake lines. So the brake lines are 100% protected by the battery box or the battery case, which is going to be down here somewhere. This leaves plenty of room for other applications. So you'll see over on the, uh, on the battery case itself, we're going to be showing you the uh, the, the coolant lines that are going to go to the rear motor. Uh, nicely done. Uh, it's nicely done. Engineered. Yeah. yeah so then, let's, oh. then on the rear of the vehicle, oh, uh, the only yeah. connection that they have back here is going to the rear inverter and rear motor. And then those brake lines that Sandy was just mentioning, brake lines, the, no, excuse me, those coolant, coolant lines yeah. that Sandy was just mentioning connect here to go to the rear motor as well. So not a whole lot to do at the back end of the vehicle. So while we're staring at that motor, um, uh, we've noticed that people are very, very interested in the uh, um, VW uh, ID4 motor. Um, we've never really done a detailed motor example like that before, but uh, I mean, it's almost got a half a million hits. Uh, so we're gonna be looking deep into the Ford electric motor. The one in the back is probably PM, and this one here will be an induction motor. So slightly different and I'll explain the differences when we get to that point. Let's go and look at the box itself. <clears throat> um, right here is what, um, is what Ben was just describing is um, where all the connection points are. So these ones are the ones that are going back to the rear motor and these two here are the in and out for the, for the battery uh, pack coolant. But um, why don't, you, uh, why don't you give us a little bit on all the rest of the stuff that you found, Ben? All right, we'll start with the side rails and the structural members here. These are uh, aluminum extrusions. It is virtually an entirely aluminum case from the outside, but these are large members um, <coughs> that, that are designed to, to support the vehicle in any sort of crash scenario. Um, you can see another extrusion that's going down here. This is where that one piece, uh, uh, that was connected to the front cradle connects into the battery tray. There is what appears to be an aluminum extrusion across the front that has been bent back. Um, they couldn't weld it to get a good seal, so you can see a whole bunch of JB Weld putty something put in there to seal it out. Um, the, the top of this is a composite battery tray cover. Uh, did this to get a, some weight reduction in the vehicle. Yeah, these, uh, these things are kind of interesting as well. Um, these are uh, foam, um, foam applique, so it's got uh, sticky back tape for this. And you'll notice that they've outlined where they're supposed to go. This is done with a robot, and this is very reminiscent of what you find in airplanes, so that operators know where to put things like these patches or componentry and it makes it easy for the operator to drop things in place. Um, they've only got a few shapes. I can only count five right now. But, um, but this makes it easy for the operators to, to do what they need to do. The other thing we were <laughs> searching all over for, and then Al Steyer spotted it, the uh, vent uh, for the battery tray is in the back with the two little crosses on each side. Um, it's a 
different spot. We don't normally see that there, but, uh, but it worked out, uh, works out good for them. Um, one thing I guess we're mm, maybe not as pleased about or um, uh, kind of a mystery. On this side, these wells look pretty good. These would all be robotic. But on the other side, uh, Ben, can you show them what, uh, what you found over there? Right. The same welds <coughs> on this side do not look like they uh, were programmed by the same person. You can see the weld comes across and then it goes back into the middle and stops. And the same thing with the outside weld here. It'll come across and then back into the middle. Um, the weld that's holding this extrusion in here, you, it is, there's some burn into the aluminum extrusion at the front of it here. So the quality on these welds are uh, not the best. And the fact that they are different from mirrored items from one side to the other, uh, it's kind of, a, like Sandy said, kind of a mystery is why they would program this side different than the other side. And there's little spots throughout the battery tray that are yeah. welded different from one side to the other, from one component to the component right next to it. Um, I worked for a long time in a welding industry and uh, that's not what you really want to see. Um, the welds are, I mean, they're going to hold up and everything, but usually what I want to see is consistency and accuracy and I want to watch how it puddles. So it's, like I say, these ones are pretty good, but the other ones, the ones on the other side, uh, they're just not consistent. And I like consistency because consistency means I'm going to have high quality continuously. So whoever is programming that side needs to uh, go back to the drawing board, or actually back to the tube and uh, correct that. So let's go back and have a look at that guide uh, component that, uh, that Ben was talking about just a bit ago. This is what it looks like when it comes off. Oops, let's do it this way. When it comes off, so really and truly, when you put this thing on, it is nothing but a guide. And, and quite frankly, um, initially when I thought about it, I thought, well, geez, why don't they use it for support? Obviously it'd be in the wrong direction. But the more I think about it, the more having a machine guide, and then you can see the, the locating feature here. Having a machine guide, looks, uh, this looks like a pretty good idea um, on, uh, on further examination. I don't know, to me, uh, the battery box, and being as it's crash worthy on top of it, looks like uh, good engineering. Um, I, uh, I can hardly wait till we get this uh, sheet molded compound uh, cap off so we can see what's going on inside, but that'll be a little bit down the road. Okay, so uh, Ben put a little uh, chart together and that'll be on the bottom of the screen here, but in essence, what it is, it's looking at which vehicle, the battery uh, pack weight, the uh, battery pack capacity, so in uh, kilowatt hours, and then the driving range. Now, we've put a couple of these things together before, and uh, so we know at least, um, at least six of them are absolutely correct. Um, the Mach-E, we're using the data that, that we've Ford's gathered. Provided, yeah, correct. Ford has provided. So, uh, so let's just maybe quickly go through them. So we got the Tesla Model 3, the battery pack weighs uh, 439 uh, kilograms, and its uh, capacity is 75 kilowatt hours with a driving range of 310 miles. If we look at the Tesla Model Y, it weighs a little bit less for the battery pack at three, uh, sorry, 437 kilograms, same uh, basic, uh, basically uh, battery pack capacity at 75 kilowatt hours, but it goes five miles uh, further with uh, 315 uh, miles. The Chevy Bolt, um, its battery pack weighs about the same as well, 436. It only has uh, 60 kilowatt hours um, and its driving range is about 259 miles. The I-Pace, and this is where we start to see a gigantic jump and, uh, and it really is kind of uh, frightening. Um, the I-PACE is at almost 600 kilograms. So remember, the other guys are under 450. It's got a 90 kilowatt hour battery, but it only goes 234 miles. You'd think that it would go further than that. Uh, that's less than the Chevy Bolt. We look at the e-tron. Oh, I can't even do it. Here you do it. <laughs> that one jumps up another 100 kilograms, up to 700 kilograms. 
it does get a little bit more uh, capacity with 95 kilowatt hours, but its range is dropping even more down to 218 miles. Um, these two vehicles, the iPACE and the e-tron, are perfect examples that battery pack capacity is not the way to go yeah. to increase range. There's a lot of other things that you can do between uh, efficiencies in the vehicle, in the motors, in the gearboxes, and uh, the aer aerodynamics of the vehicle to help with range and then lightweighting the entire vehicle. Well, the other thing too is, I mean, the wire harnesses are, I mean, even, even, even you get losses just by running electricity down wires. It, uh, these things were both uh, uh, not very well done. Yeah. And then the i3 that we had was a 233 kilogram battery pack. Uh, it's small, only at 22 kilowatt hours, and it would go 81 miles. Uh, then the Maki -E here that we dropped, we weighed it yesterday, and it came in at 485 kilograms. We do we do not have the extended range version, so this one's only at 68 kilowatt hours, and it will go 211 miles. Um, as far as the weight on this, it is more than the Model 3 and the Model Y, uh, but there is some some structure that's going it's on significant, here. Significant, yeah. See a significant amount of structure that's here that's not in the body in white. So uh, we know that we get uh, viewers from all over the place. Um, uh, and normally I don't make uh, commercials, but um, I'm, I'm here to try and make it so that uh, people can afford the vehicles, companies can make profit, and, um, and we can uh, basically save the planet, if you want to use that term. Um, if anybody from Audi would like any assistance, um, we'd, uh, we'd like to offer our services. Not free, of course, <laughs> but, uh, but I think we could help out a lot with Audi and probably Jaguar. We know we're gonna be getting some help, or we're gonna be giving some help to some of the other uh, manufacturers of, uh, of electric vehicles, obviously not Tesla, but, uh, but we, um, we're definitely, uh, definitely interested in helping anybody that needs it get to where they need to get to. Any other uh, spots uh, that you need to cover here, Ben? I think we've covered it all, Sandy. Okay, good, well, hey, thanks very much for watching. Um, have a good week, and, uh, and we will be talking to you again soon. Uh, the cashiers could still use that money. So uh, keep tipping, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye.